encourage your soul, enlighten your mind, and empower your faith. This is The Light Network. Hello and welcome to Preachers in Training. I'm Robert Hatfield. This is the podcast on which we discuss all things preaching and ministry. And in as much as it is January, uh, you know, we're all making our plans to uh, migrate our way to Henderson, Tennessee. The good news is we've already had a big snow. And so anyway, uh, he, uh, the first of the year means, too, that Dr. Doug Burleson is back to uh, share with us a preview of the lectureship and sort of tell us what's coming up. How you doing today? Welcome back. Thank you. I'm doing well. I'm glad yeah. to be out of the uh, the snow and the ice. Uh, the pre-lectureship <laughs> yes. weather, it got us all in the spirit right. of lectureship. And- so um, if we're playing like Groundhog Day, but for lectureship, mm-hmm. does does pre-lectureship snow mean we've gotten it out of the way? Or I mean, because we had like seven inches. We had a lot. I, I don't know. I'll need to consult like okay. Tom Childers or some other oh, historian good. to know exactly what the, i don't know if the that's groundhog's good. involved in that sure it's a different holiday if tom childers sees his shadow <laughs> yeah that's, <it> is. <laughs> that's a great okay. if you've got to bring out the trench coats and the hats then right. you know it's probably going to snow again i uh i always look look forward to seeing if clyde woods brings out that hat that he wears you know the one i'm talking it's about a nice hat it is a very it looks very warm it does i mean there's a lot of nice we have a coat rack or two that we bring out just for the lectureship yes and it's really intended to hold those nice hats Good. and coats well it needs um, to be sturdy it's a service <laughs> <laughs> We're having too much fun today. We haven't been out in public very much because of the ice and the snow. Uh, the lectureship this year is on the theme of Triumph of the Lamb, the Battle of Evil in Revelation, coming up February 4th through 8th, 2024. It's the 88th annual Bible lectureship at Fried Hardeman. Revelation, I, I yeah. remember last year we talked about it because this theme had already been announced. That's right. Um we actually stuck with it. Yeah, we actually went through with it. Congrats! Yeah, I know. There's, Unfortunately, the Lord did not come in the meantime. There's still a little bit of time, but you know. And it's really funny. Like, just a quick side story. I, since the early '90s, we've been going back and forth, Old Testament, New Testament. Yeah. And those who remember that, which is probably a small group of people, uh, would know that there are maybe three New Testament books that we've not covered yet. Mm-hmm. And so I've been doing this nine years and we've already done like two of the three gospel accounts we had not covered. Mm-hmm. We still haven't covered Matthew, which is a shame. Yeah. You know, you think, wow, that's surprising. I know we've done John and we've done Mark and Luke in the right. last Most nine years. Most people start with Matthew. You would think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we got down to like, uh, I don't really know exactly what we had left, but Revelation is one of those things. And it was like, mm-hmm. I know that most people either ignore this book or base their whole religion on it. But surely there's middle ground. No, nobody's in and, the middle. You know, we've got to do something here and not give yeah. the impression that we're afraid of revelation. Right, right. And so it's been the most challenging program we've put together by far. Mm. Cuz you can easily get lost in the weeds and have a whole series on the Gog and Magog. But, you know, we right. didn't want to do that. We also want it we still strive for balance. So there's stuff for prison ministry and digital ministry and Mm -hmm. uh, healthy sexuality workshop and just things that seem out of the box, but we want people to enrich their understanding of the biblical text, but Mm -hmm. also grow in their service of the Lord. Good. Uh, So some of those things you mentioned, uh, those like special tracts, I guess, is that Mm -hmm. what those are? Those seminars or workshops that are a part of the lectureship, those aren't necessarily based in revelation. Those are just, uh, you know, special studies focused on those themes. We have a guy at the retreat whose job it is, is to literally count to make sure we've maintained some balance between exegesis and application. Mm. And that's been really important to our planning process. And so we've tried to be very thoughtful, even in like the the series or two on missions, Mm -hmm. it's tied to text and revelation. So there's a, there's a connection but we don't force that. And mm-hmm. so the series on prison ministry, we didn't go crazy with <laughs> trying to find, you know, references to the prison and revelation. So it's, yeah. um, I think we've been responsible with the text. Mm-hmm. That's, that's very important to mm-hmm. us. Uh, and, and hopefully it'll be, obviously the text is relevant, but right. uh, we're trying to also just avoid silly controversy. 
I, I can't tell you the number of emails I've gotten in the last six months asking if I think Revelation was written during the reign of Nero or Domitian, mm-hmm. or uh, whether I'm a preterist or a futurist or a continuous right. historicist. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just, I want to urge people to start with the biblical text mm-hmm. and uh, ask some appropriate questions that we'll try to be consistently applying all week. Mm-hmm. Great. That text meant something to the original audience, to the churches to whom it was addressed, right? <laughs> it wasn't first written to me. No, it wasn't. <laughs> right. And and the symbols, as difficult as they are, you always yeah. want to follow the symbols that are interpreted by the author. Boy, like that's Revelation helpful. 12, yeah, I love that. Or Revelation 1. But at the same time, I've always thought about Revelation like a big table with four legs, and you've got to keep all four legs balanced or nothing's going to stay on the table. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. those four legs, quick sermon. Good. First century context. Mm-hmm. That's where the preterist people like to live. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Future expectations. That's where the futurists want to live. Mm-hmm. Symbols. That's where the symbolists want to live. <laughs> and then Old Testament background, because there's yeah. over, almost 300 places. And so if you can maintain some form of balance there, I think that's a really healthy way to allow three of the lenses we typically use when we read Revelation to stay in the room with you. Good. You know? Yeah, that, that's helpful. I, uh, let's, let's go down the preachers in training route of this for just a minute. And revelation is a tough book. Uh, it, it can be tough to interpret and, and therefore to understand. I mean, the general message is there, right? I mean, over and over again, the Holy spirit reminds us, you know, uh, God wins, <laughs> you know, yeah. victory. Uh, let's see what a triumph of the lamb, of the lamb yeah. you know? So, That's right. uh, that, that piece of it is unmistakable. I mean, it's, it's all throughout. And even like, you've got these weird beasts that are coming up out of the sea and the land. And, and then at one point there's this woman who's on top of one of the beast and all this, but there are these little respites along the way that says, but, oh, by the way, you know, kind of like, don't lose heart, those sorts of things. But, um, even if, even if some of those symbol, the challenges and the symbols weren't there, it can be difficult to preach through revelation because you have to spend so much time just talking about what the vision was. <laughs> you, yeah. you run out of time to make application and you can't like skirt that stuff. And then uh, you have these tangents, but those are the, the tangents are the things that revelation is known for like 144,000, 666, yeah. Armageddon. Right. right. I mean, in the in the narrative flow, those things, I mean, they obviously have a place. They're there. I'm not diminishing them, but they're not like the be all end all linchpin yeah. issue of the whole text. Um, but that's the stuff everybody wants to know about. So you can't just be like, well, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna mention the whole meaning of the 144,000 thing. So I don't know. Have you ever preached through Revelation, not counting? one through three and then maybe four and five <laughs> and 21 and 22 and 21 and 22. Yes. You know, uh, I don't want to oversimplify this, but more and more, I, I think that reading revelation as a Christ centered mm. message, even with the bowls of wrath and the breaking of the seals. I mean, who's breaking the seals right. who's describing. Right. So in chapter one, I think that's evident in a number of ways, but especially in four and five, mm-hmm. I've always been struck by the fact that in chapter five, John, is mourning the fact that no one can open the scroll. And then the worthy lamb who was slain opens the scroll. Mm -hmm. He can read the scroll and guess what? The scroll's about him. Yeah. That just seems to me to be indicative of the fact that God's justice. And even in chapter one, the very beginning of the book, this is about Jesus. It's from Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's of Jesus and it's tied to his authority. And so maybe one of the messages that this book, wants to remind us of is that regardless of where we're living or when we're living, uh, Jesus reigns and he will reign. And those who accept that will be rewarded. And those who reject that will be punished. That's the thing is, is we, we do such a disservice. There are other passages of the new Testament and even the old that, that speak to a hope like that, to a, a triumphant victory of God and of his people and of the Messiah who would come. And in the new Testament did come but it's just kind of unique in revelation. It is so pointed and yeah. so clear. Um, and we're missing out if we don't put that in the rotation somewhere, Bible class or sermons or something. Yeah. And, and it's like the minor prophets. I mean, you, mm-hmm. 
you spend so much time talking about who Nahum was writing to and what that you're out of time. And so yeah. I understand when you got 25 minutes and you're trying to persuade from the text that how difficult that is, but maybe breaking that up into chunks. I remember making the mistake. I went to some website where you could make it look like you had a church sign, like the name, I think it was church sign generator.com. I'm oh, not endorsing, okay. yeah, I'm not endorsing this site, that may be but, but you could, but you could, uh, <laughs> you could put the name of your congregation. You could put uh -huh. the message on the sign. Yeah. And uh, so I made, I, I thought if every congregation in Asia minor had its own marquee with a message on the sign, what would the message be? And oh. I did this in a Bible class where okay. we tried to think through, okay, to the church at Smyrna, using that message, what would the message be? Mm -hmm. And it was really healthy, but then I tried to preach that. And I just found that to be incredibly frustrating and weird because it's sort of anachronistically forced on the text, something that really mm. was more our idea than what John may have been communicating. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't claim to have it figured out, but, and I'm not sure that preaching the whole counsel of God from Acts 20 means it's every verse, but right. <laughs> to neglect, um, what I think was put at the end of the canon for a reason mm -hmm. about our hope and expectation would be, would be really foolish. Mm. Uh, the, the people to whom John wrote or Jesus through John uh, wrote were dealing with some real problems. Uh, there aren't exact parallels necessarily from, you know, 2024 America to first century, you know, Asia minor, but at the same time, there are some relevant applications, real pertinent applications mm -hmm. that can easily be made. Maybe that's the reason why we focus so much on the first three chapters and, right. and then on 21 and 22, you know, we, we like the hope that's there. Um, somebody I was reading sort of put it this way and see what you think about this. They said there were three main things that the, the Christians were, were facing back then. Number one was uh, uh, pressure from the Jewish community who were still hanging on. Uh, they didn't like the Christians and they tried to throw them under the bus every opportunity they got in that culture. Number two was their Greek neighbors. Um, and of course, you know, very pagan society. Um, we can debate to what extent, you know, emperor worship and those sorts of things were actually going on. And maybe it was more localized depending on the, the local government and how much they enforced whatever the empire was saying, but whatever's going on there, there's pagan pressures. And then third, it seems to be, cause you have references to people like, Jezebel in uh, Revelation 2 and 3 and the Nicolaitans, that perhaps there was this gospel, which is not another, um, of conformity. Why don't you just blend in? You know, just go and do whatever you got to do so you don't rock the boat too much and you can enjoy the blessings of the empire without sticking out like a sore thumb. Um, that sounds familiar. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. There's some pertinent applications mm -hmm. there. Are there additional issues that come to your mind that maybe they were facing? And then, you know, to what extent will, as we say that preach? <laughs> yeah. I, I think historically people have made the mistake of trying to find some really big empire wide persecution. And mm -hmm. so it's gotta be about the emperor. Look, if, if somebody in, in Henderson, Tennessee, decided to begin persecuting Christians, my world's in turmoil. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be worldwide, empire-wide. And so uh, I, I think the challenge of a historical context where we just don't know everything they were dealing with, but they were human, mm -hmm. and they certainly, through the influence of Hellenism and syncretism, mm -hmm. uh, knew that pressure. I think from a literary perspective, one of the reasons we love two and three is because it's epistolary and we mm -hmm. love epistles. They're mm -hmm. propositional. It's easy to make that connection and anything. That's why Daniel seven through 12 makes for a lousy VBS. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. not narrative. It's like, what does this mean? I uh, thought Daniel stopped at chapter six. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think you and I are very much alike uh, because you're moving. It's why Jonah is the most popular minor prophet. It's narrative. Right. It's not sermon. Except for chapter four. We well, don't, we don't we don't want to talk about chapter four. Yeah. He went and preached and and they repented and the curtain closes. Uh, and, yeah, there's no pout on the hillside. No. <laughs> the prophet whose name means dove suddenly <laughs> goes all in on the destruction of the Ninevites. Yeah, that's that's not a good Mother's Day text. But <laughs> right. But it's uh so revelation is just I think it's all of that. We don't mm -hmm. understand apocalyptic literature. Mm -hmm. It's hard to think about how they felt as 
their martyred loved ones are crying out from beneath God's throne. How long? Mm. And here we are, generally speaking, not everybody, mm -hmm. but generally I'm healthy. I'm, I'm right. provided for, I'm free mm -hmm. and I'm spoiled. Yeah. And uh -huh. that, and that's, um, so what's this all about? Yeah. John even mentions one of their own Antipas uh, yeah. to my recollection. He's the only individual in revelation who is a martyr who is specifically identified, but yeah. Um, you know, that, that meant something to those people, even though it doesn't mean a whole lot to us as we read his name, but, um, you know, they, they knew him is, seems to be the implication. Um, uh, yeah. How about, um, you know, the, uh, somebody said that perhaps we are uncomfortable with revelation in addition to some of these things we've just mentioned in part, because this book really forces us to use our imaginations and maybe we're not used to that. Eh? What you said about uh, epistolary style, uh, you know, it's just apocalyptic literature is just different. And, and then sometimes the symbols seem a little weird. How, how can a, a, a beast have seven heads, but 10 horns? So how many horns are on each head? You know, and, I thought you had had that figured out. By now. <laughs> you know, it's like, how does all that work? And then, and then it's got seven heads, but it speaks with one mouth. Thanks for you a know. great coloring book. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're willing to go out of the lines a little bit. But so that, that can be a challenge for us. You know, first of all, I don't, we struggle to even imagine this to begin with. And then yeah. the, the imagery can be a little fluid at times. Yeah. It reads like an HG Wells novel. And we're like, <laughs> right. what is this about? But it's also funny that historically, I think Christians have read the Bible allegorically. I mean, we've really mm -hmm. wanted mm -hmm. to find ourselves in scripture rather than finding the meaning and applying it to ourselves. Uh -huh. And you would think Revelation would be a great playground for that. Mm -hmm. And it has been. And mm -hmm. I think as readers of Revelation, part of what is a major turnoff is you're just sort of walking through the wreckages of all these failed attempts to understand this book yeah. through weird lenses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think, wow, if all these people have failed and all of this misunderstanding about the millennium and about whatever is tied to this book, who am I? Right. As right. a, as a Christian who just wants to please Jesus and know his will. Furthermore, what in revelation really tells me what to do to be saved. I mean, there's, so yeah. it's, it's just the combination I think of in among God's people, a desire to take scripture at its word mm -hmm. and to be literal interpreters of that and to try to respect the genre. And you come to revelation and you either think this is just too wild for me. There's just been too many failed attempts or I'll just take the stuff that I'm sure of, yeah. uh, which is basically Jesus is victorious and I will be too. Mm -hmm. And all that other stuff, I'll just, you know, what happens with the frogs in the Valley of Megiddo? <laughs> right. I'm going to let, I'm going to get to glory and find out, right. you know, what that is. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I think there's just a lot of pressure and part of what the lectureship we hope will do is help people to give some, context to that and to mm -hmm. see you know like our keynotes at night are really about um the church and and how we th should think about the church and we're, we're primarily focusing on those epistles because that's mm -hmm. what you do yeah. but like one of the keynotes is about the church that makes jesus sick and mm -hmm. it's it's ephesus i'm going to spew out of my mouth and mm -hmm. so i we want to respect the context and we've really tried to be careful with that this year since there's so much that people could go everywhere mm -hmm with but um you know if i'm afraid to study a book because it might challenge my faith especially if it's a book that's in scripture mm -hmm. maybe that says more about my faith than it does about the book yeah yeah spew out of my mouth you said ephesus lay out a seat you mean thank right? you okay I, yeah well i was like i was i was looking because i'm helping looking me. over here and i was seeing the evening lectures and so i was going through here but yeah. as you said, I thought, did I hear that or not? Well, you, uh, I was thinking about the 10 horns on the seven heads still. So <laughs> thank you for bringing me back in. What is going on here? <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, a lot of times we pick up any commentary on Revelation and you open it up. And depending on how thick the commentary is, you may have 30 or 50 or 80 or 100 or 500 pages of introduction breaking us through those different interpretive methods of the, of the book. And that can be helpful. And I, I, it, it, it is obviously helpful. Um, we need to study that. Some people's brains, I think, maybe 
are more turned that direction maybe as an introductory thing. But like, Mm -hmm. if that's the very first thing I ever Uh, get out of revelation, I'm sort of setting myself up for failure almost because I can't keep all those in my head at once while I'm encountering things that I've never really encountered before. Yeah. And what's even better are those commentaries that give you all four views Yes, of every passage. And then you're just left swimming in a sea of options. (laughs) I don't know. And here I am. I'll flip a coin. (laughs) It's a very, humbling thing but so here's the yeah. good news like there's one series on that all week cool yeah it's at 12 30 and our thought was okay i keep hearing people say that most of my brothers and sisters are preterists i don't think that's true mm-hmm. I, I don't i think for me like there's three of the four that make sense that i can apply mm-hmm. i can't really buy into the continuous historicists like this is a map of human history because everybody who believes that only makes it about western civilization right yeah and that's a problem yeah that's <laughs> like sorry eastern hemisphere <laughs> this part of the bible is not for you yeah but it's just the other three i think there's some validity there but you've got to it's it's difficult to maintain balance but mm-hmm. it wasn't first written to me mm-hmm. it's not all been fulfilled yet and these symbols i think there are symbols i may never understand until glory right. and that's okay yeah it's yeah. okay we don't have to no and usually you can piece together the the big pieces of this puzzle in that context and you figure out what the symbols are generally communicating. Yeah. 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 And I still can get the message. Right. That's it. Yeah. Uh, applying a timeless message placed in time, 1230 in auditorium B as a part of the lectureship to your point <laughs> about this series, uh, the preterist view, continual, continuous historical, idealist, and futurist views on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That'll be a neat series. Yeah, and if, yeah. if people want that, they can go get lunch and come back and have indigestion immediately afterwards. <laughs> Bring your times, <laughs> Auditorium B, 1230. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> One thing, and, y- and y'all are going to bring this out in the chapel addresses each day, uh, the book of revelation and you mentioned this it just keeps coming back to the lamb and it, it is interesting there there are many designators of jesus particularly in those first three chapters mm-hmm. but this lamb uh, imagery just keeps coming back and as you continue to read through it even all the way down to 19 and 20 or so you know you still get this lamb the lamb the lamb and i'm i'm got the schedule in front of me here but uh chapel addresses the victorious lamb the slain lamb the son of man, the enthroned lamb. Those will be neat. Yeah. We chapel is a unique time uh, mm-hmm. because our student body is there. Uh, they're sort of a captive audience, although they're supportive. And <laughs> we, we've really tried to think about the message and this, and maybe even the speakers that uh, could speak to everybody in the room. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's not easy because Uh, I think Titus two shows us that we should be building intergenerational Mm -hmm. connection and uh, the lectureships for all those folks. And so what better time is there to focus on Jesus and, and try to, um, you know, keep the main thing, the main thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Seven beatitudes of revelation. Yeah. I, that, that might could be a sermon series. Somewhere it it has been yeah, in my ministry. <laughs> and uh, some of those, it's, it's interesting because they're loosely connected, mm-hmm. um, but they, they are connected. And so I'm excited about that series. It's going to really, I think we want this to be a time of textual study that encourages people. And so uh, there's some great speakers, great topics there. I was, joking with brother billy you know um his is blessed are those who stay awake yes and i did not mean for that to be funny (laughs) but i told him i said you know if you think about the message of that passage it's it's a powerful uh, reminder to be watchful to be resilient to Mm -hmm. be uh, so we've had some fun with some of the titles uh (laughs) but we've tried to be thoughtful with regard to what god revealed in in those texts uh, you do have a, a a series on numbers and symbols, 130 yeah. each day in Auditorium A, uh, addressing 144,000, Mark of the Beast, 666, Battle of Armageddon. Um, yeah, that'll be helpful. We chose the speakers that we had a beef with. Uh, <laughs> everybody on that series owes us money. They owe us money. No, <laughs> that's funny. No, it's just really, how can you do Revelation and not talk about that? Yeah. And even our team lectures, there's some of that mixed into that, which 
one of the things I'm proud of with the teen lectures is that it's not, you know, uh, superficial stuff. They're getting mm. some in-depth look at uh, not only those themes, but some songs we sing about mm. the Alpha and the Omega and mm -hmm. what, what do those messages mean and what do we learn? And so uh, that's going to be uh, having two teenagers that participate in that. I'm invested in that in a unique way. And then two in the kids lectureship, the same, the same deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, lunchtime singing. Yeah. Freshening your congregation's repertoire of, uh, I didn't even say that right, but I'm from know Pulaski. How to spell it. Uh, I'm from Pulaski, Tennessee, but, uh, you know, there, there are some introducing new hymns, reviving neglected hymns, hymns, but, uh, Mondays is of interest to me. 1130 old chapel hall singing from revelation. I'm for, for a book that we do um, sort of shy away from. We hey, surely sing from it an awful lot. Second to Psalms, I think. Mm. I, I've, I read someone who said, uh, second to Psalms is revelation. Mm. And yeah, you know, John Wiegand and John Hall and Jesse Eaton, they make a great team. Mm -hmm. And they really do a great job with the Monday night singing, with that series, and with the hymnal of the heart thing they do in the summers yeah, here. That's great. And so lectureships always involve singing. And uh, we're going to give them the keys to that. They're always creative. And we have we usually just sort of broke for lunch at 1130 mm -hmm. after chapel. And we're like, all right, see you in an hour. And we realized, hey, there's an opportunity to stagger lunch and to have folks that if they want to sing, they can build up even more an appetite for the associate's kitchen or gaino by <laughs> by doing a little singing yeah plus it clears out a little bit too and you don't have to wait in line See, as there's long. all kinds of i like the there's way you little... think <laughs> okay uh is there anything I'm, I'm i'm sort of trying i'm looking at this you have a great schedule at a glance yeah, here uh, thank and... you that's where the preachers go to see the alliterative because uh, yes. yeah. we stress over that i mean good <clears throat> just for that one page in the program right. we like we've got to we've got to make sure these these run even though most people never look at that page. Sure. So thank you for looking at that. Oh, page. you have to, you have yeah, to, it's this helpful is, to me. You can see it all right here. Uh, it, that's page four on the program, which is mm -hmm. available on the website, fhu.edu slash lectureship. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm sort of looking through, I've sort of hit some high points. I haven't covered everything that, that you all have planned for the revelation series. Is there anything associated with revelation that I haven't mentioned that you just like for us to make sure we, we don't neglect. Yeah. There are 27 lectures that are tied to our two books. Um, there are 14 by men and 13 mm -hmm. by women that are connected to books that we're really proud of that are already available. Mm. Um, and so I've heard from people who ordered them from Amazon and they've already gotten those. Hey. We ordered a couple thousand and ours are coming hopefully soon <laughs> for us to have available uh, that week. So um, there's a ladies luncheon that, that one of those uh, ladies sessions is tied to, I read both books twice in, in the proofing process and wow. they're excellent. Mm. And so if you want to sit in one room and listen to a textual study of revelation all day, every day, mm -hmm. that's the book series mm. cool, or the ladies series. So uh, there's a lot of rich study there too. And then you have the book to accompany with sure. notes. And, and it's not, it's not a manuscript. They're not going to read, mm -hmm. but it is uh, complimentary to that. And so our thought, as we talked about last year on the podcast, is uh, this is a book that could serve individuals in study, congregations in study, couples. Mm -hmm. We just want it to be more than a, a nice maroon book to go with the set right. on the shelf. It's, it's intended to be used. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard of churches that use these. I'm sure you've got many more use cases than I have, than I have but uh, uh, Bible classes and things mm -hmm. like that. I mean, they, it becomes the quarterly study and yeah, the lectureship sort of lives on and blesses churches even well beyond February in Henderson, Tennessee. So. We hope so. Every lesson has questions for discussion at the end and uh, they are designed to be used in those settings and are really good. I just mm -hmm. really have been encouraged by the way you know, even going back to Ecclesiastes in 2021, mm -hmm. those books are still being uh, purchased monthly. People are using those. Yeah. And that's what the goal was, was for it to live on beyond 2023 or whatever year yeah. that might apply to. Great. You know, in addition to all of this, there are some things that having a lectureship on campus of Fried Hardeman University, it's just unique. Um, and I'm thinking about things like kids lectureship. And I know that the 
the uh, school of education has a lot mm. to do with, you know, helping yeah. to staff that and, and make it happen. Uh, there are things like that. And, and I'm noticing here as well that the uh, FHU college of business is hosting the best business practices for congregational life, two thirty uh, each weekday, Monday through Thursday in auditorium D and what a blessing that's going to be. Oh, we, we want every year to try to pull out another college on campus or, one year it was the athletic department coaches mm. did a whole thing on mentoring. Mm -hmm. We've used our psychology counseling folks an awful lot. This year, the university counseling center is going to be oh, uh, wow. hosting our evening devotionals. And so, yeah, uh, Matt Vega, the Dean of that college and his team. I mean, I I'm not a, a business oriented person, mm -hmm. but if you're trying to think about how to better budget, how to better manage your finances, how to better plan. I mean, these are the guys that, our pros in that area. And so we just, we really genuinely want this to be a time that's useful. Mm -hmm. And so there might be some folks that need to hear that. Yeah. Same with prison ministry. I mean, we reached out to the congregation in Johnson city because they do that and mm. they do it well. And it's proven every year with baptisms and personal work and interaction. There's so many success stories. And we, so we're trying to find people that are doing things that we could maybe replicate and benefit from Ryan Frazier is uh, coordinating the family series 1:30 and 2:30 each weekday marriages in ministry and parenting in ministry it's always good to hear uh, beef up on some of those things <laughs> yeah you know a lot of programs do a lot of great things for families and look I'm all I'm all in on that but I do think that Preachers and church leaders have unique pressures on their families mm -hmm. and on their marriages. And sometimes it's just helpful to know you're not alone in that. And there are other people who are thinking about that and offering help in that. And, and uh, so that's something we used to just have a couple of series, especially for families mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they would be about marriage and love, but we've, we've tried to think, okay, who's going to be here and how could this help those folks? And, mm. uh, so yeah, we're Ryan does a great job coordinating that. Yeah. Gotta have better preacher therapy with the Jenkins Institute. Gotta have it. We it's gotta be done. It's now better. It was preacher therapy. Oh yes. And I'm not gonna name the uh beloved conference that is also now having preacher therapy. Ah, okay. And uh just it's not a competition, <laughs> but I was just thinking um about how we might reword it so sure. it doesn't look okay. So one time how do we make this better <laughs> i was listening to a guy speak one time and he told a story as if it happened to him uh -huh. that happened to me like i told this story oh. and my friend he was a friend he used the story and i uh -huh. no longer tell the story because i thought well people are going to think i'm still in this guy's story even though it <laughs> happened to me so my concern with preacher therapy which i love these guys i love the jenkins institute sure is that people would think that the lectureship stole this from mm -hmm. the such and such Sure. convention slash conference slash thing right and so uh i said can we call it the better which is not even on hebrews but it just felt right the right. better preacher therapy that sounds good and, new and improved uh, so but we love that and there's uh -huh. you know the fact that at 12 30 you've got three solid options yeah um, yeah and the balconies on the main floor uh is great i love dell and jeff they always do a good job mm-hmm uh, without excuse, finding God in science and philosophy. One of those 1230 auditorium C, uh, series throughout the day. That sounds neat. So a lot of really neat things you all are offering. I've seen a lot of buzz on uh, line lately about the youth ministry workshop. Is that, is that what it it's is? Called? It is the youth and Mission family ministry Space. workshop. So we tried to find the most creative guys we could to, uh, and just give them the keys. Mm-hmm. With that, you know, you just learn that people are unique. And I'm just going to tell you that Philip Jenkins, John David Swartz, yes. and Ben McGreevy are amazing guys who are unique. They're and unique. Part of what gives them success in youth and family ministry is that they love the Lord, they know his word, but they are creative with method. Mm -hmm. And so it was a good workshop before. This is like its 26 year yeah. in existence. Wild. Uh, but last year they took it over. And uh, took it to a new level. And so this year, you know, they're just so creative. 
they have the most creative budget requests for what they want to do and how they want to go about doing it. And, okay. and I'm just always seriously, just so impressed. Uh, if, you are, if you guys hear this, I just want to borrow your creativity sometime and uh, energy, but, yes. but that's going to be, I just hope I can get out to mid South for part of that because mm-hmm. I know it'll be, I know it'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the Hispanic workshop, which mm. actually begins on February 2nd. Yeah, Friday. Okay. And runs through until, Sunday morning. Until Sunday morning. Okay. Got and it. Perry Harden and then Alba and their team. That is, so North Jackson used to host uh, a Hispanic lectureship every spring. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just encouraged. There's just something about that community and how welcoming they were and energetic they were. And, and part of the vision for this just came out of the fact that I think now this is the largest uh, Spanish-speaking opportunity for this kind of a study east mm. of the Mississippi. Oh, wow. Annually. And so we've got students who are studying Spanish. It's obviously a, a impressive language in terms of the population of people who speak right. Spanish. Right. And, and so um, I go and support it every year, although... I'm I'm really rusty on my ability to understand they're speaking everything. in tongues, but there's no interpreter. You know, some saying? sessions there are, but part of what okay. we wanted to do was for this to not be something that English speaking peoples are doing for Spanish speaking peoples. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I can't say enough about you know I get to work with Perry and Jose Luis at Estes, and mm-hmm. they just do a great job, and their families are beautiful and amazing. So uh, I sneak into that every year and leave fired up for lectureship because it's just it's the best kept secret of the lectureship mm. and i hope it will grow 10 times yeah before 25 all right uh i don't i don't know about any other lectureship that has like a theme song every year but i mean hymns are written and have been over the last what at least couple of years right yeah since luke uh he went about doing good which was a song that I still sing, although it hasn't made it in any hymnal. <laughs> it's not. Yet. Yeah. So Dr. Alan Cunningham is just so we don't ask for this. Mm-hmm. We don't ask like Judd Davis has taken headshots for people during the lectures. We didn't ask him to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's just people who are volunteering mm-hmm. their time and talents. And so mm-hmm. Alan sent me a song and he sent me a recording of the chorale singing that song mm. and they sang it uh, at a assembly I was in and, it's a victory chant. I mean, it, I won't, I won't sing it. I don't want to scare anybody, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but um, so the music is included in the program and in the booklet, mm-hmm. we've got booklets that'll be out for everybody to pick up when you're here. And we'll sing that a lot during the week. And uh, yeah, I, I have to talk to John Wigand or somebody about seeing if we can sneak that into a hymnal, but yeah, there you it's go. A, it's a great song. Right. It's a great song. <laughs> Uh, you know, open forum, associates, kitchen, exhibits, vendors. I mean, just the whole nine yards. Coffee, it's a, coffee, three coffee. swings in a ring. The lion sleeps tonight. The lion sleeps tonight. I mean, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's all good stuff. It really is. And our goal is for people to feel welcome and to grow in the Lord and to know that they're valued. And mm-hmm. we want to speak the truth. Um, you know, not everybody's a a fan of these kinds of events, uh, but we want everyone to feel like they're welcome and to come and enjoy the week. Mm -hmm. That's our, that's our prayer. FHU.edu slash lectureship. Uh, You can get a bunch of information there. Uh, There are even downloadable things that you could print or send to someone to share with them about this or run it as a slide uh, where, where uh, you worship maybe on the announcement slides or something like that. Um, yeah, it's all right there. Oh, register. That's what I was thinking. I wanted yeah. to tell people to do to yeah. register. Please is, do. Is that, I mean, you can register once you arrive. You but. can. We've got several computers that'll be set up, but it'll save you time. Mm-hmm. We'll have a lanyard ready for you with your name on it. We do that not because we're looking to uh, invade your personal information, but we just want to keep everybody safe and mm-hmm. our security guys need to know who's there and what they're there to do. Okay. So yeah. it's free. Uh, you don't have to pay anything. Um, the other thing I would say is last year we had people on campus from 38 states and six countries, Whoa. Uh, but we had about 4,500 other people online. Mm. And if you are in a situation, maybe on the mission field, or maybe you're caring for a loved one, or you're you're working and can't be here on campus, our streaming quality is greatly improved. 
Uh, we've got four different cameras that you can uh, see interacting with what's happening on the main stage. Everything we do in the main auditorium is broadcast. Okay. Uh, and you can just register and get access to that for free. And so uh, if you download the app, which was just released today, iOS yeah. and Android, you can watch those through the app too. Cool. And so it can find it all in one place. The Tell people what the, the official name of the app is so they know what to search for. Do you FHU Lectureship. Well, there, there you go. That's and, straightforward. Uh, if you go to Facebook, the links were just shared today through the Freed Hardman okay. Facebook page. Oh, okay. And uh, if you got last year's app, it just updates that. So you're not having to reinvent the wheel. Mm-hmm. But it's all new. And uh, there's some vendors that have served as um, basically as sponsors of the app. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to see some of those names of uh, people who did that there and great works that we've approved. And so Mm -hmm. a lot of good. Might even see the light network there. Might even see the light network. I was going to let you say that. I appreciate that. <laughs> the ball was on the tee. It's right. It's right there. All I had to do was just uh, you. You cracked the door. I opened it. Hey, I love it. I appreciate it. Triumph of the Lamb. The battle with evil in Revelation. Uh, it all happens February fourth through the eighth. I mean, the battle with evil is going on now. But uh, yeah, let's hope there's not a lot of battling. A lot of battling. <laughs> uh, the fourth through the eighth. Yeah, that's right. You're right. This this is an ever present reality. That's right. All right, cool. Thank you for spending some time with us and for all the work that you and and the ginormous team is doing. I mean, there are so many moving parts to what's going on to make this week happen. So we appreciate it. Thank you. It's a, I'm a steward of something that until the Lord returns, I pray is always a reality. And it's really, it's just a big family reunion and gospel meeting and Mm -hmm. academic event rolled into one big, happy time best of all the worlds it's it's good (laughs) thank you for being a part of this episode of preachers in training remember new episodes release on thursdays at thelightnetwork.tv and from our podcasting partners you if you prefer to see our lovely faces you may do so on youtube just search preachers in training or the light network on youtube hit subscribe or follow in your favorite podcast app or on youtube so you never miss an episode going to do it for this edition. Until next time, let's go preach the word.